everyone thanks for tuning in to the weekly business podcast by ruhi hosted by ruhi kazi so this podcast is for entrepreneurs marketers podcasters and much more in this podcast series i'll be bringing on experts industry and thought leaders to share their insight growth strategies etc on many topics ranging from marketing to the music industry and beyond to the weekly business podcast by ruhi Today I'm joined by a special guest Luke uh, Luke Winning who is a junior at GW and he is a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of Ichosia Tech as well as a non-profit agri-tech company which is called uh, Sakom Farms. So uh, hi Luke would you like to give a brief overview about yourself and what you do to the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, Rui. Um, and thank you again so much for having me on. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, so, you know, as it was mentioned, I'm, I'm Lucas Vining. I'm a rising junior at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm studying biology um, and I'm doing a minor in entrepreneurship. Um, and so, again, as it was mentioned, I've started two companies. Um, so I've been working with um, Icosia Biotechnology, which I founded in um, the fall of 2019. So we've been working on that um, as a corporate entity for just under a year now. Um, with that, the research that's behind Icosia um, has been going on for probably around three years now. Um, and then more recently, uh, just, just last month, so in June, I um, founded my second company, which is actually a nonprofit called Saakom Farms. Um, and I actually founded that with part of the Icosia team. Um, and we are working in Southeast Asia to bring um, modern agriculture techniques to hopefully deliver um, higher wages to rural farmers um, and enable a better education for the children in those areas. Wow, I loved your story. And I especially loved your point about how your, your startup is kind of, I mean, your nonprofit startup is kind of using this agri-tech approach to alleviate and to kind of eradicate poverty and to kind of uh, help to change education in Cambodia. So that was a great point. So uh, now I would like to delve further into, so uh, what was kind of your best advice for say a first time startup founder or somebody who wants to kind of get into the entrepreneurial space while at college? Yeah, so I would say, I think there's two things really. Um, the first thing is if, if you are a college student, um, and of course my experience is in the States, but I'm sure this is, this is true all over the world. Um, if you're a college student, you, know, you get a lot of really great opportunities that are exclusive to college students that you should absolutely take care of, uh, not excuse me, not take care of, um, take advantage of. Um, so for example, at George Washington, we have the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship and they have an entire staff dedicated to helping young student entrepreneurs um, build their ideas, figure out how they can build that into a company um, and a product, right? So there are tons of different programs within that office. Um, they have experienced entrepreneurs come every single every single week to hold office hours and you can just pop by and um, say hi and talk about your ideas. Um, they have business competitions. Um, I think they have two throughout the year. Um, they also have their own staff, which are extremely knowledgeable and um, many of them are former investors or current investors actually. Um, and then there's also probably, you know, that, that's all specific to George Washington, but there are opportunities all over the country um, and all over the world, which um, are very important to take advantage of. Um, so for example, we've done a lot, uh, a lot of business competitions that are exclusive to college students. Um, so George Washington is the, the George Washington New Venture Competition is actually the eighth largest competition in the country, I believe. Um, and that's just measured by the amount of um, awards that they give out. But the George Washington competition is a bit unique in this respect, in that top 10, in that um, the competition is exclusive to George Washington students. The other nine in the top 10 are open to students from all over the country, if not all over the world. Um, so we actually, we have done certainly national business competitions, and we have certainly done um, international business competitions and had some success in both areas. Um, and those competitions are really great, I think, for let me say two or, two or three reasons. 
The first one is that you can gather a lot of non-dilutive funding. Um, I know personally we've gathered um, more than fifty thousand dollars in non-dilutive funding from the competitions. Um, but I've you know I've heard of of companies that have gathered you know more than a quarter million dollars um, in non-dilutive funding. So that's of course very very important. And once you leave college, you don't really have that opportunity anymore. Anyone who's going to give you funding, unless they're the federal government, will expect something in return. They'll they'll respect they'll expect um, return on investment. They'll expect equity, etc. The other really, um, really important thing um, about these business competitions is that they are a great opportunity to get first feedback um, that that won't be uh, too harsh, but that will be um, completely real, if, if that makes sense. So the judges at these competitions are very often um, experienced entrepreneurs. You know, they've they've built and sold. Um, one if not more companies themselves they've been through everything that you'll need to go through um, they will have some great feedback for you um, and then the other big piece of advice i'd say um, if you're starting out uh, is to really make sure you don't try to do it all by yourself and you're not trying to do too much at once um, so you know I, I certainly as an entrepreneur i love to push through and do things as quickly as i can um, i won't pretend that that's not true but at the same time you know i recognize that it's very important to have a strong team backing you and to be realistic in in what you can do um, and to set realistic goals and expectations so the team at icosia is i think there's seven seven or eight of us now um, four of us work full time um, but i mean so that team started as just two of us and we built that up um slowly steadily and, and organically um and i honestly i really you know we couldn't have done the work that we did there if we didn't have all those other team members um, similarly the team at uh, comb you know even though we're only a month old or so we already have five five people working um or should i say volunteering for us um, and each, you know, each of us have a, has a different focus. So whether that's um, executive leadership or marketing or fundraising or international development um, or business development, um, we, we have someone to focus on each area um, and you know what your responsibilities are. Um, and again, you know, it would really be impossible to do the, immen the immense amount of work that it takes to run a startup without that team. Um, and then the other piece of, of teamwork is not just your own team, but also making sure you have very strong advisors. Um, so again, I apologize, I'm a little bit all over the place here, but going back to Icosia, you know, we have um, two, or actually three now, re really great advisors. Um, so Dr. James Shirley, he is a former professor of biological engineering at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Um, so he's more of our technical advisor. He gives us some really great insights um, into both the science behind um, the tech that we're producing, as well as the blood banking industry. Um, and then we have Carl Genter, who is an IP expert, um, and he's sold multiple uh, venture-backed companies before. Um, and then we also have Tony Parr, um, who's relatively new um, to our team, um, but he's been in the blood space for, I'm going to say years, if not decades. Um, and so he knows he knows everyone in that industry. He can um, tell us exactly, you know, exactly all the things that we don't even know we don't know. Um, and that's really what your advisors are there for, um, is, someone, is someone to lean on um, when you're not exactly sure what you should be doing. Um, that, I mean, that's going to happen a lot when, you, certainly on your first company, even on your second company, um, you know, you're not going to be exactly sure what the right course of action is. And it's, you know, it's, frankly, it's foolish to try to pretend like you can figure it all out yourself. Um, so really, really lean on your team, really lean on your advisors um, and take advantage of all of the opportunities that you get exclusively as a college student. Yeah, you made up a great point about how it should be a combination and in kind of an intersection of uh, teamwork, of kind of you taking advantage of your college kind of resources that are already set in place for you to kind of take it from an idea stage to an eventually a company a profitable company and uh, so what are your kind of best strategies for you said that you kind of rely a lot on your team so uh, what are your best strategies for how to develop and how to create a solid working and effective well-rounded team yeah well i think you know the the most important thing is to be critical of look at yourself and 
understand what are you good at and what are you not good at. And both of those pieces are equally important. Um, so, you know, I think it's obvious why you have to know what you're not good at. Um, but it's also very important to know what you are good at um, and to be honest about that with yourself. Um, and so then to fill out those missing pieces, I'm going to say, um, with other people. Um, and I think, you know, trying to find those other people can be, can be challenging so sometimes. Um, but I think something that COVID has not necessarily shown us for the first time, but has certainly um, allowed us to take better advantage of is that, you know, we really are part of a global community and there are people not only at our own universities, not only in our local geographies, but really people all over the world um, who are very smart and who are very passionate about the work that they do. And there is certainly somebody out there who can help fill those team gaps, you know. Um, so we've worked personally with with people in um, in the United Kingdom, um, in Taiwan, um, not on my team, but we work with people um, in Indonesia, China, um, UAE. Um, so, you know, it really is a global community. And it really is important to take advantage of all of those opportunities. Um, and again, you know, you have to realize you can't do everything yourself. Um, so when you're, when you're looking to build that team, um, you know, don't be afraid to, to, I don't want to say hire, but to team build, um, you know, one or one or two or three people at a time. Um, I know some companies they you have to be really careful. And I think it's different, right? If you have investors, um, versus if you're a nonprofit versus whatever your situation may be. Um, but sometimes, you know, having a lot of employees is a mark of success sometimes it's something you have to be careful about you know i think if you're a, a relatively small team and you're talking about the difference between one and maybe four or five people which is probably where you will be um, when you're first starting out um, you know the difference between one and five and four or five people is huge and you know you can do so much so much more work um, with a five person team than you can with a one person team. The difference between a five person and a six person team, you know, it's, it's still important, but it's, it's marginal comparatively. Um, so don't be afraid to bring on a couple people. Um, that said, do be careful with who you start a company with. Um, not so much in, in quantity of how many people, but be careful who that person is um, because, you know, you will be spending a lot of time with them and it is difficult and painful to remove those people um, if need be. So, you know, you might be spending 12 hours a day with that person or those people every single day, seven days a week. Um, so make sure it's somebody you like and somebody who you can work with um, and somebody who will really complement your own skill set. Wow, you've shared an amazing kind of insight about teamwork and all these various different aspects that kind of come into play. And I loved your point about how you have to kind of leverage a global talent pool and also be very strategic and mindful about who you st decide to start any new business or any new venture with as that is very critical as well to kind of how your mindset will be towards that business or whatever work or anything that may be related to that. So um, now kind of shifting away from that. So what is has your experience been like as a serial entrepreneur? And could you kind of share a bit about your experience in creating a nonprofit startup and yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, well, let, me, let me start here. You know, I'm not sure I would necessarily classify myself as a serial entrepreneur. Um, you know, two companies is certainly more than one, um, but they're, they're men and women out there who have created, you know, 10 companies, 20 companies. Um, so I'm not sure I fall into that category quite yet. Um, perhaps I'm working towards it. Um, but I can, I can certainly expand more on my experience of starting uh, multiple companies, I'll say. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the first time around, um, you know, if, if anyone has a background in, in corporate formation. Um, so we started um, a C corporation, which is, um, it, it's just a, a type of company in the United States. Um, the most, probably the most common type, um, if you're looking for growth, um, and scalability. Um, so we started a C corporation and that's, you know, frankly, um, that's a pretty easy process. Um, I get a lot of questions actually about, you know, how are you able to do this? And wasn't that 
difficult and expensive and you know et cetera and et cetera um and it's you know it's really something you can google um uh, it, it takes maybe a week um it costs a couple hundred dollars you sign some forms pick a name um and that's it and you have a, and you legally have a company you have to pay taxes um on all, all of that good stuff um and so there are a lot of, uh, I'm going to say, administrative things like that. You know, um, how do you form the company? Um, how do you deal with the, the legal work? Um, how do you do the accounting finances? A lot of stuff like that that, you know, is important infrastructure for the company. Um, but, you know, it doesn't really necessarily contribute towards the work that the company is doing. You know, it, for the biotech, it's not the research. It's not going out and talking to customers. It's not selling. It's just making sure that the, the company and the team don't crumble um, while you're doing all that work. Um, and that, I think, you know, it seems it, it's very exciting to start a company, to be doing groundbreaking research. Um, but you have to make sure that the, the infrastructure is there. Um, first. Um, and, you know, it's an, it's an ongoing process too, certainly. The good thing about that is that on the second time around, um, it's much easier to figure figure that stuff out. You know, you already know what accounting software you like. You already know what incorporation services work well, um, which ones are maybe not as good. Um, so a lot of the figuring out, a lot of the uncertainty, uh, which is certainly something that um, challenged me a lot, is the uncertainty of of what to do, um, a lot of that's gone. Um, and it, don't get me wrong, you know, there's still a lot of points certainly that that need uh, that you will need advice on, even the second time around. Um, but a lot, a lot of it's gone, um, and things can move a bit more quickly. So that said, the second company that I started, Saakum Farms, that's a nonprofit, and that was a, a still relatively simple. Um, entity to form um, but it was also sort of different um, so you know it's uh, to just to form the entity is, is about the same you know to to file the paperwork to pay your couple hundred dollar fee but to get the 501c um, in our case 501c3 tax status that you know most nonprofits are known for that's a little bit more complex um, you know, the IRS has to be very careful about who they give that tax status to. There's there's a good chunk of paperwork and figuring out what the what best way to do that is. Um, so, you know, even even on the second time around, you know, every company will be a little bit different um, and will present new challenges um, that need to be worked out. But, you know, really, that's that's the fun part of starting a company, right, is is doing the things you haven't done before um, or hopefully the things that nobody's done before. Uh, you know, that's not the corporation stuff, but, um, you know, do, doing that new stuff, being challenged, not not knowing what to do and building these amazing teams with new people and building up that network. That's that's really the fun part of starting a company. So it's not something to be afraid of. Um, my best piece of advice for potential startup founders. Um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing I have to say is just, just start the company, <laughs> you know, or not necessarily start the company, but certainly take the time to investigate your idea. Everyone, everyone has a good idea. Um, take the time to go out and, you know, talk, talk to real people, see if it's something that would work um, in the market, um, you know, if it's a tech-based um, company, go and do some preliminary research to see if the tech is feasible. Um, don't be afraid to go do that work. Um, and certainly, certainly do not be afraid because uh, of failure. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a statistic, 90 if not 99 or something crazy like that percent of companies fail. Um, it's true, you know, you probably will fill, fit into that 90 or 99 percent. But, you know, especially if you're in college, you don't have a ton to lose. So, you know, really don't, don't be afraid of that. Um, also, you know, when you're, when you're thinking about starting a company, you know, do be actively thinking about, am I, am I doing something new? Am I trying to fill a gap um, in the system already, right? So like at Zacom, we're looking at, I'm going to say hundreds of hundreds of nonprofits around the world, which are doing really amazing work with really um, amazing visions to help people in poverty, um, again, all around the world. So, you know, you might ask me like, well, you're, you're a college student. Why do you think that you can really 
help, right? Um, with your, again, with your small team and limited resources, how are you going to really add any benefit um, to these, you know, incredible and frankly, large organizations, right? Like the American Red Cross, Habitat for Humanity, um, you know, the list just keeps on going. Um, so the key there is to try to make sure that you're filling a gap. So what we noticed is that a lot of these, a lot of these nonprofits, you know, they are doing amazing work, but the model is to sort of take in money and then give that money back into communities in the form of, I'm going to say one-time gifts, um, or, or, um, or grants. And, you know, that's sort of, um, a challenge that we see in international development. So what we're trying to do, right, is to take, take in money and put it back into a community, um, as, as more of an investment, right? Um, so something that will continuously give back to that community. Um, so that's just, you know, that's just one way um, that we are trying to, you know, quote, fill a gap. But I think, you know, perhaps the way people are more familiar with that is, um, and perhaps in consumer products, right? So, you know, you have product X and you have product Z, um, is there something, um, something that the market needs that's missing. Um, that's certainly the other way to do that that I, I think people are more familiar with. Um, and, you know, again, I, I love doing this work, um, both at Icosia, uh, Icosia Biotechnology is a for-profit, and Sagacomb Farms, which is a nonprofit. Both are certainly ventures that aim to bring social good. So um, if, any, if anyone else is interested in getting involved with our work, um, please feel free to visit our website at www.saacom, that's S-A-A-K-O-M dot org, um, or Icosia Biotechnologies, that's www.icosia, I-C-H-O-S-I-A dot com, um, or reach out to me, um, and I would, I would love to chat with you more about our work um, or any ideas you have for us or any of the ways you'd like to contribute to what we're doing. So, yes, we are certainly trying to disrupt the market. You know, donor blood is a system that has stood for a century. Um, and actually, I, I can't remember if I really covered this, but so what the work that we're doing at Icosia is we are working on a method of generating red blood cells from stem cells in a laboratory. And that's a process that we are trying to enable with um, genetic engineering techniques. And so you know, the idea would be that if we can make this process scalable and economically feasible to such a degree that it can be mass produced, that it could significantly supplement, if not perhaps one day, not tomorrow, but one day, um, entirely replace the donor blood supply chain, that that would become our business model, right? The problem is, is that, um, or not the problem, but the opportunity is that we're coming up against an industry, the donor blood industry, that has stood and you know, mostly worked, be, albeit with a, a couple of flaws, but mostly worked for a hundred years. Um, and to some degree, at least comparatively to under, other industries, you know, really hasn't changed. So blood bankers, um, hospitals, patients, really everyone is mostly comfortable with that system, right? So when we talk about introducing a new, a new product that's laboratory grown rather than donor derived, it really is a disruption to that market. On the saw comb side, right, we don't want to, you know, quote, disrupt the work that other nonprofits are doing because they are doing, you know, really great work. We don't want to take away from that. We just want to add to it. Um, and, you know, we, we did a, our analysis and we thought that the best way to add to the work that other nonprofits are doing is not just to do exactly what they're doing, but at a small scale, but to try to do something different, try to use a different business model um, and see, see if it could complement that. Um, of the work that other nonprofits are doing, if that makes sense, right? So, you know, maybe uh, to summarize that up, the goal, the goal of the nonprofit is not to replace other nonprofits. So you guys can connect with Lucas Vining on Instagram at lucas.vining, all lowercase, and LinkedIn as well, it's Lucas Vining. So uh, you can also find out what he's been up to with Sacom and Ichosia, biotech by going on to the following websites www.ichosia.com and www.sarcom.org or you can fill out the contact form at info at
Now, just a small request. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review the podcast in Apple Podcast. Or if you're listening on Spotify, make sure you follow there, subscribe and share the podcast with other people. Hope you learned something new today and look